Welcome everybody. So good to have a great turnout today. I'm Jacqueline Fuller and I run uh, Google Giving. And it's a real pleasure today to introduce um, someone who's become a friend and is one of the leading lights of the whole technology and social media sector. I'm going to read a little bit from Beth's background. So um, her first book, A Networked Nonprofit, introduced the sector to a new way of thinking and operating mm -hmm. in a connected world. She built on that with her second book, which we have over here for sale, Measuring, measuring the Networked Nonprofit. Got the two biggest memes in the nonprofit movement: measurement and networking in the same title. Way and to data. Go. And, and, and data. Oh, in the subtitle. Using data. Using data. Using to data change. to change the world. You should have said big data though. Then oh. it would have been really trendy. Um, <laughs> awesome. Using data to change the world. Um, she's also the author of one of the most popular blogs in the entire nonprofit space: How Nonprofits Can Use Social Media. She's got over 30 years in the nonprofit sector. She's done um, training, she builds capacity, she's facilitating um, nonprofits non learning about these themes of networking and measurement across the globe. She was named one of the most influential women in technology by Fast Company and one of Business Week's Voices mm -hmm. of Innovation for Social Media. She's a visiting scholar at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation as well. And one last thing I wanna say about my friend Beth, um, is that uh, when I was having lunch with another colleague who's in the space of technology and social impact and said that I was going to introduce Beth, she said, oh, tell them this, that whenever someone comes to me who is maybe new to the sector or interested in learning more about technology and nonprofits and social impact, the first thing she always tell them, tells them is to follow Beth Cantor. So oh, with well. that, I'll turn it over to my friend. Great. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay. Thank you, Jacqueline, for that great introduction. And uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to be here with all of you. And I want to give a big shout out to the Vista folks who I had the pleasure of having lunch with. And I always like um, talking uh, to young people. I, you know, I've been in the nonprofit sector for 34 years. That's how I got my start. And 20 years ago, almost to the day, I um, had a front row seat at the creation of a field. How nonprofits can use the internet for social change. How exciting is that? And as I was telling someone at lunch, I said, I've always been driven by my curiosity. I didn't have a grand career plan. I just followed my passion and followed my curiosity and desire to learn. And, um, and when I started my first technology job, I didn't know a modem from a microwave. OK? You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> OK. And, but I was able to learn from the techies, translate that, and help um, activists and NGOs and nonprofits learn how to embrace this technology. And I've been lucky to make um, that my calling for the last 20 years. And I've worked with thousands of nonprofits, literally on all continents of the world, on uh, people who are passionate about that question of how can we use this online technology for social change? And that's what drives me. But I also have a personal passion and a personal commitment to service, like all of you in Vista. And I, am, I have a personal connection to Cambodia. And that's why I'm contributing my royalties to send that young lady, um, Kyo Saban, uh, who's now entering her junior year in college as a civil engineering major. Um, and that will change her life. And I had an opportunity to meet her last summer. And she said to me, Miss Beth, she calls me Miss Beth, sometimes Mama. Thank you very much for your support. It's very important to me. But I would like to go to graduate school in the United States, and I would like to go to MIT, Stanford, or Harvard. I said, OK, we'll sell a lot of books. <laughs> so I was really, really um, proud that the book uh, won this year's Terry McAdams Nonprofit uh, Book Award. It's sort of the highlight of my career. And, um, and it was a bittersweet victory for me because um, the week that they announced the finalist, um, my dad, Earl Cantor, um, uh, passed away. Um, gave up his courageous battle with Parkinson's. But I felt blessed that I was able to share that one last um, professional achievement with him. And to honor his memory, I did a social fundraising and an online event. And I used, I ate my own dog food. I used the ideas in my book. And so he gives us all a final lesson on how to use these tools 
and get better results. And I'll share that with you um, at the end of the presentation. So let's get to it. <laughs> My first book, The Network Nonprofit, co-authored with Alison Fine, was about how nonprofits needed to transform themselves from nonprofits to network nonprofits. And this, the definition is that network nonprofits are agile, they are adaptive, they're transparent, and they're masters at using their networks and experts at using social media to build relationships with stakeholders and to make the world a better place. Now what I've learned in practice as a trainer and a capacity builder is that adapting this new way of working happens very slowly and incrementally. So I uh, came up with a maturity of practice model and it was inspired by this Martin Luther King quote that I keep it on my computer, I love it. It's, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But you have to keep moving forward, okay? So when I work with nonprofits, I you know, see where they are in their transformation to becoming a networked nonprofit. So we have the crawlers. And there's nothing wrong with crawling. Crawling's good, you have to start somewhere. How many of you are parents? Few, okay, did, when your kids started to crawl, did you say that's bad? No, no, no. Okay, so crawling. They may need to develop a communication strategy, formalize it, um, outreach strategy, or there may be some uh, uh, organizational culture issues, okay? But then quickly they can get to walking. And at walking stage, they began to link their social media and network use with results. But they're doing it in terms of pilots, experimenting with one program, one campaign, or even one channel. And here also they are building incremental capacity. Typically I see nonprofits maybe invest up to 20 hours per week of staff time at that walking stage. And then there's a chasm that they cross to get to running. That does require more staff investment, but at this point they have a formal ladder of engagement. So they know how to take their supporters from passive observers to champions for their cause. They have a robust content and engagement strategy um, they have a practice to experiment and to learn how to uh, apply and use new platforms and new techniques. And they use some measurement in that, maybe not throughout the organization. But to get to flying, at the flying stage, they've built their network. Yay, they have many champions and influencers supporting their work and spreading their ideas and messages. They have multi-channel engagement um, uh, with their content and, um, and they are measuring, uh, the, measuring those. And they also have a formal reflection and a continuous improvement process throughout the whole organization. So crawl, walk, run, fly. And the framework that's in the book breaks down 12 best practices in becoming a network nonprofit and looks at them at different stages of maturity. And organizations can use this to help move them one step forward at a time. The book, of course, takes a deeper dive into the measurement practices. And that's what we're going to look at um, right now. So one of the big ideas in the book is about how do you become a data-informed nonprofit? And notice I'm not using the word data-driven, the phrase data-driven, because data-informed means that the organization has a culture of measurement and a culture of learning, and they bring their wisdom and their data <laughs> to decision makings. They're not driven by the, the data, and they're collecting um, and using the right data. So I have three stories about nonprofits, and somehow they all ended up being animal uh, welfare organizations. So how many people like dogs? Okay, how many like cats? Okay, how many like other? <laughs> okay, I'm sure we don't have any animal haters in the audience, right? Okay, so there will be a story for you. Okay, <laughs> my first story is about an organization that I just love, it's called dosomething.org. How many of you are familiar with them? They are awesome, okay? Their mission is to get over 15 million teens active in online social change, uh, social change causes. And they are my poster child for being a data-informed organization. Um, I have an a, a in-depth profile in the book, but what I learned about that is that it really starts at the top. Okay, so five years ago, um, 
uh, people on their board like Reid Hoffman and DJ Patel, who is the data scientist at LinkedIn, sat down with Nancy Loveland, who is their CEO, and sort of said, lose your gut. You know, all decisions should be based on saying, what does the data say? But they didn't just say that. They talked to her about building the infrastructure and the culture for that to happen. Now, what's really amazing, if you go and visit uh, dosomething.org at their office in New York, you will discover, even though they have a somewhat small staff in the nonprofit sector, that they have three full-time data scientists on staff. And those data scientists, they don't just sit in the corner and play with their spreadsheets and don't talk to anybody. They have an open office space, and they are collaborating with staff. You know, when they have a team to launch a campaign, they have the creatives, they have the mobile team, they have the social media team, and they have the data person. So that they're always learning and that they're always measuring their results. And two of the mantras that I picked up while I was there were this, and I thought they were fantastic. The first one is tear down, the, tear down those silos around data. Okay, it's not, I'm the fundraising department and you can't have my data. <laughs> it's everybody working together. And the other one that I thought was quite profound and has really changed my whole measurement practice was spend more time thinking about what the data means than collecting the data. So let me give you an example of one of their uh, recent campaigns. Um, and here's where the uh, animal story comes in. Uh, they launched a, a campaign based on some research where they found out that a lot of um, pets were languishing in shelters and being killed. Because, why, why do you think? Because there weren't enough great pictures of the pets being shared online and on social channels. So they built this app that um, where they could recruit young people to go into shelters and take pictures of the pets and then share them online with their friends and encourage them to adopt the animals, to do fundraisers for the shelter, or just raise awareness around these pets. So they launched the program um, on the Today Show. Okay? And so whenever I tell this story, I usually hear a uh. But they got on the Today Show, and there's this cute little cuddly, squirmy little puppy, and Kathy Lee drops him on his head. <gasps> no, the puppy was okay. But what happened is that, of course, it got captured, it got uh, put on YouTube, um, a video of it happening in fast motion, slow motion, forwards, backwards, you know, um, sports annotation on it, um, and bloggers picked it up. Um, but what's important here is that first sentence that says, today, do something.org launched a program. That link over to the landing page, all of a sudden, and I was in the office when this happened, um, it, a lot of people started clicking. It happened on national TV. The, the data scientists went out into a room and they were actually looking in real time about the conversion rate. How many people were downloading the app? Why, how can we, and they were brainstorming how they can improve the landing page. So um, that's data informed at its essence. So, um, and of course, they have now the results. Um, it wasn't just a matter of um, people getting to that landing page and downloading the app. They had ways to measure each rung on that ladder of engagement from finding out about it on the Today Show up to people, uh, young people helping and facilitating or adopting pets and less pets being killed. All right, so this next story is about a more traditional nonprofit, the Humane Society of the US. How many of you know their work? Okay, so that's uh, Carrie uh, Lewis and her dog Bella, who's also featured <laughs> in the book. And, uh, and Carrie and the Humane Society are early adopters of social media. They were kind of the front runners in the field five or six years ago when people were still saying, what's a blog? And, and when adults weren't allowed on Facebook, okay? Um, so, so Carrie's been an early adopter, and I had her t take the uh, crawl, walk, run, fly assessment, and I said, you know, Carrie, I bet you're running or flying at least. And she said, you know what? I think we're trying to scale being data informed. I think we're in the walking to jogging stage, and part of it had to do with the silos in their organizations and the ability to share data and to share insights about what was happening in their campaigns. So they decided to start a pilot where they would bring people from different teams and they would actually do a, a, a debrief, bringing their data, looking at what worked in the campaign, uh, what didn't work, and what they're going to try for the next campaign, and generate something called the what worked and what didn't work report. And, um, and now this is starting to spread within their organization, so more teams are doing this. 
Um, and uh, one of the stories that uh, she also told me, it was great. How many of you know what a swear jar is? Okay, you know, like if you, if you have kids and you swear, you're supposed to put some money in the swear jar and not swear. Um, uh, okay, so they created this thing called the source code jar. And let me tell you the genesis of that. Back in 2011, uh, they wanted to measure the conversion rate from social media to fundraising. Like how many people heard about us on Facebook and then came over and made a donation? What's our conversion rate? Well, they couldn't track it. Do you know why? Because the web department didn't want to use Google Analytics source codes. On the it was too much trouble. So Carrie convinced them to try a few pilots. Try it, let's see. And then she was able, uh, her team was able to report back what they were able to learn from it. And the web team got so excited that they started the, um, the, the source code jar and that any campaign that didn't have a, a Google Analytics source code would have to pay a fine. And Carrie's happy to report that they never got enough money to go out for ice cream or beer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Last story, and this one is about Upwell. Upwell is an ocean conservation organization that works with a network of ocean conservation organizations, okay? And they have adapted um, the lean analytics, lean startup mode for the way that they measure and learn from their social media campaigns. So what they do, they do a lot of um, something called big listening. They use a program called Radiant 6, and they look at the, the social chatter that's out there, and they look for opportunities around ocean conservation conversations. So once they find them, they package uh, content with their partners, and then they launch their campaign as a conversation with the metric of increasing the share of conversation about the particular ca uh, cause, whether it's ocean adacification, ah, I said it, or shark conservation. They measure their impact, they learn, and they spread those uh, lessons out to the network, rinse and repeat. So let me look at, uh, let me show you one example. Okay, so are there any data people in the room? Okay, this, like data people just love this. <laughs> okay, so what you're looking at, all the different colors represent keywords that relate to their causes. Ocean as acidification, sustainable seafood, sharks, whales, um, tuna, uh, overfishing. And they use a keyword methodology so they can fetter out someone who mentions Ocean City, Maryland versus you know, Save the Ocean. And they look at the amount of chatter that's happening around those keywords. And as you can see, the pink ones is the word shark. And like, oh my god, more shark. Why was there a spike in chatter around sharks? Can you guess? Ah, oh, you, you know, OK, Shark Week. <laughs> who, who watches Shark Week? OK, all right. Um, watch it once and you'll get your explanation on what it is. But um, So a lot of people are, are tweeting with this hashtag Shark Week. Okay, so they went in for deep dive, no pun intended. Um, and okay, so what are the, what's the sentiment of these people who are tweeting around Shark Week? What, what is the nature of what they're saying related to shark conservation? So we have Jaws, oh my god, sharks, get me out of the water. <laughs> we have um, Save the Sharks, which is just their people. Those are the people who already know and care about shark conservation. And then we have, yay, sharks, shark lovers. And that's what re <laughs> represented their opportunity here. Can we get the yay shark people tweeting and passing information and talking about shark conservation? So they worked with their partners. They did something called a shark in R, <laughs> which is a webinar where they brought them together. They talked about what content they could share, what tweets, what links they could share, and, and they let them loose. Um, they had measured a benchmark of what the conversation was before, and they looked at what it was after. And did they raise, uh, increase the shark conservation conversation? Yes, they did with uh, the knitting. So those are. Just three stories of nonprofits that are um, data informed and probably flyers or getting to flying. Um, so let me talk a little bit about some, prax some practice, like rolling up your sleeve, some practical things, some principles, um, practices of measurement. And I'm not going to go into the, I, and now, no, I'm not going to talk about multivariate analysis. I'm not going to talk in detail about actually how to set up a source code. I'm really going to talk about um, good measurement practice in an organization, in a nonprofit. Okay, so I have to go back and show you 
Um, each ch one, one of the things I wanted to do in the book was one of the, the initial things that I discovered when I was doing my research, and I, I was lucky enough while I was at Packard that I had 60 Packard grantees testing the frameworks that were in the book while we were writing the book to generate the case studies. I'm not sure I'll do that again, but, um, but they, we were in real time saying, is this something that you would do in your organization? Is it easy to do? Is it hard to do? How can, you know, is it working for you or not? And so we adjusted the framework slightly, and then it also produced um, all of the case studies that are in the book. So, um, so but all that aside, when I first got into it, I, there were a lot of people who were afraid of measurement. Maybe they flunked math or, 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 or whatever, but they had this fear of measurement. So I had measurement cartoons grace each chapter. And this one says, I know it's hard to measure engagement, but there has to be a better way to make people laugh and feel at ease. Because my goal, my ultimate goal was to tr uh, help nonprofits love and embrace measurement, which would in turn improve their outcomes. So um, the first thing is having a measurement discipline. Okay, I, I, I come across a lot of nonprofits where they're collecting data, but there's no framework behind the data to help them think about it. So the, um, the book has a whole chapter on Katie Payne, who is my co-author's Seven Steps of Measurement. Um, pretty straightforward, starting with a goal, looking at your audience, cost, benchmark, KPI, picking your tool, getting some insight, rinse and repeat. So one of the things that, um, sometimes is most mis demystifying is um, it's, it's not so hard to find, define what success is or what outcomes um, nonprofits want to reach because it relates back to their mission. But, it's, but the complicated part is whittling it down and figuring what is the most important data point that's going to tell us that we're successful. And I use the, a phrase in the book called, it's not a KPI, which is a key performance indicator, it's a KBI which is a kicking butt indicator, okay? So what you need to do is to gather a group, uh, your team, uh, uh, people in the organization who are working on the project and talk about what does success look like and then what's gonna tell us that, hey, we're kicking butt on this or we're getting our butts kicked and, when, and picking that one metric that matters to know that you're successful. Take some discipline, and this is from, uh, that whiteboard is actually from uh, the ACLU of New Jersey, um, where they said, we're just reading your book, we're reading this chapter about the kicking butt index, and we're in the room, we're here, and look what we did, this is what we discussed, and it works. <laughs> um, the other thing that I hear when I go out and I talk about this, and I think this is where you, Vista uh, folks, can really be an asset to nonprofits, is I always hear, we don't know how to use Excel. We don't have the skills. Why aren't you measuring? Because we, we don't have the skills in-house. We don't know how to do it. Um, so organizations need to improve their data literacy, uh, whether it means going out to the many sources of volunteers, maybe using that LinkedIn board source tool and finding a data scientist to come into the organization to help them, coming to Google and begging, uh, stealing a Googler to, uh, to work with them, or are or, or, or you who are working with Vista helping the organizations that you're working with to, to help organizations get comfortable in some of the basics and maybe handle some of the more advanced um, techniques for them. So, so really, really uh, focus on data literacy. Okay, then it's the picking out the tools. If I were to tell you, if I had a, a dollar for every time I got asked questions about measurement tools, I'd be really rich. I could retire. Because it seems like that's what people are mostly interested in. They ask questions about the tools. Because it's easy for us to talk about the tools, it's a little bit hard for us to have measurement discipline. But when we talk about the tools, it's important to remember that there's three categories of tools, and they're gonna collect different types of data, and you're gonna use different tools to collect different types of data depending on what your goals are. So we have content analysis, like the Upwell story, and that's looking at um, and measuring well, how well your messaging's doing or sentiment. Um, there's, if your goal is around uh, behavior change or preferences or, or looking at attitudes, you're gonna be doing some survey research. If your goal's around expanding traffic, uh, engagement, or taking some kind of action, or you know, making a donation, signing up to volunteer, then you're gonna be looking at one of the analytics tools. And I have to say, the nonprofit sector loves Google Google Analytics. Um, love, love, I, they all would like t-shirts that say Google Analytics. In fact, I personally have one, although I, it didn't match my outfit. 
um, <laughs> or else I wouldn't have, worn, would have worn it. So the idea here is don't think about the tools first. Think about what tools are going to get you the data to help you figure out whether you have reached your goals or been successful. And then, how many know who this guy is? John no, who? Who is he? Who? Okay, and do you know his famous line? Do you know the famous line in Crocodile Dundee? That's the knife. The knife. Okay. <laughs> okay. So he's in New York. Okay, he's in New York City. He's getting off the subway. It's Crocodile uh, Dundee, and um, and some punks come up and they want to hold him up, and he says, "You call that a knife?" He said. That's a knife! <laughs> okay, so what I say in analysis skills, that's a spreadsheet! <laughs> okay, so this spreadsheet comes from Global Giving, and so often I see spreadsheets from nonprofits, and it's just data without a framework. And so they are gathering with their knife, cutting data from different sources, and looking at it in context against their goals and their strategies. So now that's a spreadsheet. Okay, and actually this is a collection of spreadsheets that I've been collecting from nonprofits um, on a Tumblr blog called F Yes Nonprofit Spreadsheets, okay? So if you really want to look at other examples of nonprofit measurement spreadsheets, uh, check it out on Tumblr and you'll find this one. All right, and finally, this whole idea of reflection and improvement. Um, you know, we're so busy in nonprofits. Check it off the do list. Let's, let's get it done that we don't hit the pause button and reflect about, okay, what does the data actually mean? And how are we going to change what we're doing to get better results? And I love Moms Rising because um, they have two organizational processes that I just love. And I, I, I love to see here when organizations steal them. And the first is they do Metrics Monday, OK? So every Monday at their staff meeting, and they maybe have a dozen staff members, if that, they sit down and they have a section where they look at their metrics against their key performance indicators you know, and, and discuss it. And they may do deeper dives, but every Monday they're looking at their metrics. And during these meetings, they have institutionalized this concept called the joyful funeral. Okay, because they know that they're experimenting with these new tools. Things don't always work. You know, how many campaigns that you ran were completely perfect the first time you did it? Of course, everybody, right? Um, but things don't go as well as they should, and, and you tweak, and you measure, and you improve. So here, if, if they find something that's not working, they said, we're going to call a joyful funeral. And what that is, is they actually have a formal funeral for a particular technique or tactic or something that just didn't work. Okay, that, oh, you know that Twitter chat? That was my idea, and it t we got three people to show up and two tweets. That bombed. <laughs> Let, should we give it a, um, a joyful funeral? Yes, I'll call the flowers. Okay, it's time for the eulogy. They actually give it a eulogy, and when they're talking about the eulogy, they'll look at their data and they'll reflect about, is it time for us to stop doing this completely, or is there another test or another experiment that we can set up? Because they know that to get a big win, they have to fail or have some things not work or to even to have incremental wins. So I think it's a great technique. So the practices are, you know, finding the right metric, you know, that kicking butt metric, um, data literacy in your organization uh, from within or from without, from without side, finding the right tool to get the right data to know that you're successful, um, making the time for analysis, now getting a, now that's a spreadsheet, and also making time for reflection and continuous improvement. So I want to end with a story now that, uh, about uh, the final lesson that, um, about social media measurement that I learned from my dad um, and that I can share with all of you because I think it's a real gift. Um, uh, my dad uh, was 91 when he passed and he was an OBGYN doctor for many years. And, um, and uh, when we were uh, writing his obituary, we figured that he probably delivered 10,000 babies. And he uh, chose that profession because he wanted a medical air specialty that w uh, had joy and happiness in it. And what's more happy than bringing a new life into the world? And, um, but he had other interests besides work. He was uh, an early adopter of technology. Um, you know, he was the first person to get an Apple computer back whenever he had, um, he, he was an early adopter uh, uh, of the internet. He showed me how to sign up for, for email. Um, he was an early adopter of beeper technology, cameras. He just loved technology. But 
more than, what he loved even more than technology was the ocean. He really cared deeply about the ocean um, and ocean conservation, but mostly also surfing. So are there any surfers in the audience? Any surfers? Well, if, you, if there were, they'd recognize that the board he's carrying is a Greg Knoll board, which is a classic. It's a big board. And that's actually me and my brother in the ocean. So I wanted to find a way to honor, honor him. Um, and so I came up with, I was going uh, to do a social media fundraising campaign to raise money for Surfrider Foundation for ocean conservation, and um, also to do an online memorial event. Now, uh, when a surfer dies, um, they do, in real life, they do a paddle out. And a paddle out is where they all paddle out in the ocean. They get in a big circle out in the ocean. They hold hands and they throw flowers up in the air um, to remember that the surfer who, who passed. So I thought, given his love of technology, I wanted to do something virtually. So I came up with um, an online memorial event where I get people to tweet the hashtag Ocean Love Earl during the 24-hour period and share stories of their love of the ocean. And, and goal is to get as many people to honor my father in this way um, and also raise some money. So, um, so one of the things that I want to get nonprofits passed is don't just count, okay? Get beyond counting, okay? Yes, you have to count when you measure. That's the first level. So if I'm counting, I could tell you all of this, all these stats about the campaign and pat myself on the back. Wow, I raised $5,500. I got 128 donors with 87% donating um, more than the suggested minimum gift level. You know, I converted 85% from Facebook. Um, 72 percent were strong ties, um, and only two percent actually even knew my dad. And like, wow, wow, aren't those great numbers? And and that was about the fundraiser. And I could tell you a little bit, the, you know, the same sorts of things about the event. You know, that wow, I had social reads of over a million. I got over 3,000 people tweeting with the hashtag, and, and so forth. But get beyond the numbers, okay? Use all those practices and measurement. And and I did. <laughs> and I want to tell you a little bit about what I learned about uh, social fundraising and uh, online events. So the first thing is that um, you, know, you have to set a goal, and you have to do it based on benchmarking. Okay. Now, I have done uh, personal fundraising campaigns in the past for happier occasions, like my birthday, and I've been able to raise 5,000. So I thought 5,000 is a good goal. Um, uh, but um, sometimes we're afraid of not making our goals, so we put them way too low. Or on the other hand, we're totally unrealistic and we're out of context and we put them way too high and then we beat ourselves up because we failed and we, don't, and we give up. So benchmark, look at what others, or look at your past. And I did 10% more than the goal. Um, the next thing is don't suffer from the too small to fail. Okay, and I, I have done this in my fundraising campaigns. Um, I would send my minimum gift level as like five dollars or ten dollars, thinking, okay, my friends aren't that rich. I'm gonna, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give them an easy in. And people donate at the suggested gift minimum, and if it's too high for them, they'll donate less. And I found that out because I did. $25 uh, as the minimum gift level. And I got a little clever. I named each gi uh, giving level after a wave. And I think uh, $200, $100 was a cowabunga. Uh, $25 was a pipeline wave. And uh, you know, $250 was, were hurricane swirls. And I had, what was it? Uh, I had 128 donors with 87% donating at least the gift minimum or above. So if you don't set your minimums too low, and people will give according to what you ask for. The next is, um, see my dad was the first uh, early selfie taker. He experimented with cameras. So I have a whole collection of selfies of me growing up. See, it's not just a new thing in, in uh, the last couple of years. Um, but what, what would happen is every time I got a donation, I uh, thanked people publicly. And I was using my Facebook profile. And every time I thanked people for a donation, and I did it very personally with a personal picture and a link back to the campaign, I got more donations. Because I compared the time that I posted my thank you with the time that I got the donation. And I found that 85% converted from, from Facebook. But really, the lesson here is about social proofing. And social proofing is modeling the behavior that you want other people to do. In this case, it's, oh wow, Beth's thanking all these people who are donating to this campaign. And I'm, I'm a friend of Beth, and, and I've seen what's been going on. So I, yeah, I'm going to donate too. So it's this whole concept of social proofing. 
So um, the, the other thing that I had in the campaign is that I had a, a continuum of ways for people to engage. You know, from the high ask, which was, you know, write a check or, you know, put, put in your credit card, give some advice to the campaign, share a personal story about your love of the ocean, to things that were at a lower level about just sharing the hashtag or retweeting. And it's really important to have that continuum of engagement because people are going to come in and out at different levels. Um, and there's a great article about that at the Stanford um, uh, in, uh, Innovation Review about the, um, the donor journey, the donor vortex. And I apply that idea to this campaign. And it works. Um, at the same time, you're also supposed to have, think about influencers in your campaign. Now, you know what an influencer is? Someone who can influence other people to, to make a donation. So while I had different levels of engagement, I also targeted people who were influential within their network so they could inspire their networks. And, um, and so I had 11 different um, uh, you know, blog posts or Facebook posts from influencers that represented different segments of my uh, personal network. So I had the nonprofit tech people, I had the, uh, the social media people. Because um, I was raising money for Surfrider, I had the surfers behind me. And I was also running an analysis, um, a social network map of all these different networks. Now the big blue one, that one's my network. But there were also these other networks where there were other influencers um, that could reach into getting more gifts that came in. So, um, so this was a, a way of, of, of getting influencers to leverage your network and to think about it in a networked way. F finally, I know a, lo a lot of us have been experimenting with promoted posts on Facebook. I hear it a lot uh, of, from nonprofits. And what I decided to do, I knew that if I spent money to, with the goal of trying to c convert those in the amount of time that I had and given the, the campaign, it probably wouldn't work as well. But I had another goal of getting um, people to tweet with the hashtag. And at the same time, that I also knew that uh, Mashable was writing up the whole thing, was talking about the, um, the hashtag event. So I timed the promotion to kind of accept accelerate what was already out there. So it was a way to, so, and you can see kind of the, the big balloon of where uh, when you use a, a, a promotion like this, it's sort of like adding uh, gasoline to the fire. So you can't expect promote a post to create the fire, but if you have where, where you're riding a wave and you had a lot of buzz around it, you can give it that extra push. Because um, again, my goal was to get as much awareness around using the hashtag in the event um, and to get people tweeting during that day. And finally, this didn't come from the numbers at all. Um, this, came, and this, oh, this came from looking and counting up what were the number of people that shared their personal story about the love of the ocean and what were some of the creative things um, that they did. And I had something around 37 instances of people sharing this, the hashtag with their story around um, their love of the ocean. And what's great about this is that if you've built your network in the right way, it unleashes the creativity. But I'm thinking like, I'm also thinking ahead and I'm thinking about wouldn't this be a great thing for me to do every year to raise money for ocean conservation and to honor my dad. And oh my god, I'm going to need content. Um, and here um, the network has produced this great content so it's, I'm not starting all over from scratch. And because I've captured it and measured it, I have it at hand when I start planning my campaign. So, um, so all this to say, I guess my point with all of these things is, you know, measurement is great, but it go beyond the numbers, go beyond counting, um, use all those measurement practices uh, to really learn. So, in summary, uh, these are, I guess, my my takeaways. Um, and hopefully yours are you know, uh, becoming, having a networked practice, having measurement discipline happens incrementally, one step at a time. Don't try to uh, have too much change in your organization. Um, uh, also, linking social media to outcomes requires some silo busting. And again, that happens um, in small steps. Um, Data literacy, um, you know, this is a real need in the non nonprofit sector, um, and uh, it's great that you're in the room. And I have the great people in the room because I know lots of nonprofits who would love to snap you up. I was talking to a couple of math majors at lunch, and I'm. I was secretly writing down your names and your emails. Um, <laughs> um, and again, go, go beyond um, counting your data and really embrace the learning from it. So with that, I want to thank you <laughs> for letting me share. <laughs> 
and open it up for questions. That hashtag, was it Ocean Love Earl? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ocean Love Earl. I broke a rule of hashtags. It was a little bit too long, but I wanted yeah. Ocean Love and Earl in there. So. Are all the tools that you're using for tracking, are they online, open source, or are you using like software, hardware, or something? Okay. So in the Ocean Love Earl yeah. example, um, I, in, in this, in this um, I like to eat my own dog food, and I work with a lot of small and mid-sized nonprofits who don't, as you know, as you all know, don't have a lot of resources and time. So I try to just use what is available out there that's low cost and free. So yeah, so I mean, I use Google Analytics, Facebook Insights. I used um, a, sp uh, a spreadsheet um, <laughs> because that I pulled um, a Razoo um, was the fundraising platform, and there, uh, and I use Rowfeeder, uh, which will gather up um, tweets um, based on a hashtag and throw them in a, a Google um, spreadsheet for, for analysis. So I use light, free tools, and my brain, <laughs> and my heart. <laughs> Um, so, for our group, for the hands on tech group that is working with all these different nonprofits, a lot of the nonprofits that we work um, with, uh, there's always that question, which I'm sure you've heard a million times, is how long should I spend on my social media? And that's, I know it's a tricky question, but any advice? Um, well, first I try to, what's behind the question? Because it, it doesn't come out when you're having a conversation about what you could do. Um, or is it coming out from um, you know, uh, the typical scenario that I see a lot, and you probably see the same, is that it's a small or organization, and it's probably one person who does all the marketing communications, and it's sort of part of their job and making time to do that. So what we try to look at is what, 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 is your, what are your goals, what is your strategy, what are you trying to do, and does it fit the, your current capacity, okay? And can you downsize or right size your strategy to fit your current capacity, use some measurement and best practices and get results. Now, if you want to start to scale your results, we're going to have to look at how can we um, invest more time or resources in this. And so usually that becomes a conversation about how can we train and get other people in the organization to use these um, resources or moving up to you know, having a half-time position, quarter-time position, or, or full-time position. And I can also say that there's lots of ways and techniques out there to be efficient. Like I've gotten really good at tweeting with one hand and drying my hair with the other. <laughs> um, so there, and there are ways that you can um, plan your day so you are more efficient. Uh, um, you know, some people, you know, I hear a lot, oh, do I have to be on Twitter all the time? And I said, well, no, you can find, use it during found time while you're waiting in line to get your lunch. You know, send off tweets. There's scheduling tools. There's lots of ways to be efficient. So I also look at that. So the, the talk about the uh, uh, target of this nonprofit, so uh, you also talk about the some Google can help on that field. So what's the uh, difference between this, uh, maybe a key difference between the uh, nonprofit versus uh, like a Google, you know, those from a... A for-profit? Yeah, for-profit like overall. And also how if uh, uh, people from a profit <laughs> organization to be successful and make a contribution there. How to adapt to the culture different? Okay, so uh, I think I heard two questions. Okay, so one was sort of difference between the nonprofit and the uh, for-profit sector, and they're becoming more blurred. Um, and you might want to look up uh, the work of Lucy Bernholtz, who is, is taking a specific look at uh, f uh, different formats and the different you know legal formats and the ways that they work between nonprofit and for-profit. And from a measurement perspective and social media perspective, I think a lot of nonprofits are more similar to small businesses because they typically have uh, less resources than a, a large corporation like Google that may have a department. Um, I think um, larger nonprofits may be similar to Google and there may be different departments, there may be more silos and that may be um, a, a similarity. I think um, the main difference is that nonprofits are measuring things that aside from some of the financial outcomes like donations or people signing up to volunteer, they're trying to measure things that are kind of difficult like social change climate change, um, saving the world. And that, that requires a, a whole other set of skills than maybe um, measuring sales cycles and, and, and product growth. Um, so your second question, which I think was about how could, I'm assuming you work for Google? 
okay, um, that how can I, as an employee of a, uh, of a large corporation like Google, make a difference in the nonprofit sector? And I think most corporations, and correct me if I'm wrong, probably you have a volunteer program where you place and have volunteer opportunities. I would find that person in a department internally. It's right there, right? <laughs> Talk to Seth. And um, if you have measurement skills or data skills, my God, can I have your card? <laughs> I know, I'm, I know, must have 50 nonprofits within the last week who've said, we need a data person. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm working on. The, uh, I'm an analyst for the emerging market. So the Cambodia, they just made something. We, we cover a lot of those uh, developing Okay, we'll definitely talk to Seth. <laughs> As a follow-up, Beth, maybe you can talk a little bit about or, uh, organizations that are effectively using volunteers to either help with their social media or help measure their social media campaigns? Um, sure, uh, the one that comes to mind, um, there's actually a, um, I, I'm gonna, their name is the Analysis Exchange, and, um, and they, uh, pair people who do analytics in corporations with nonprofits and actually a student who is majoring taking an analytics course and they will sit and do a project and help them get set up and teach them how to use their analytics program and I sent while I was writing the book actually um, some of the my uh, testers actually worked with several of them and they said it was it was great since then we've had I've seen and I wrote a uh, blog post about this called help my nonprofit needs a data nerd um, I I have seen more and more organizations that are, are doing um, uh, volunteer skill matching, and one of them is called DataKind, where they actually place data scientists with nonprofits. I think also, I know you had um, uh, uh, the good folks from LinkedIn yesterday talk to you, and they probably talked about the, the profile categories. Um, going to LinkedIn, um, if you can put your, if you're, if you're on LinkedIn and, um, well, from the, I tell nonprofits to actually go to LinkedIn and start, sign up for board source and start searching on those different skills that you need to recruit in house. And just internally for Google's, uh, Googlers who are here, you can go to go slash give to find more volunteer opportunities, including social media and, and analytics. Hi Beth, my name is Ling Ling. Uh, I'm a Vista. I will serve in Pittsburgh this year. Um, my question for you is that nowadays um, in nonprofit sector, it seems like the priority is to really apply grants so that the nonprofit will have a budget to do the job. So we're talking about the skill of budget instead of the skill of dream or their mission. And um, so have you ever tried to use social media to uh, facilitate the grant application uh, process? Or do you perceive that there will be a trend for a grant maker to <laughs> use that piece as a, a measurement for grant making? Because really, I, I really believe that we should talk more about the skill of the dream instead of the skill of their budget. I, yeah, so you're, you're talking about uh, one of my favorite topics is, you know, uh, on the one side, you know, we had the nonprofit sector using social media to do maybe grant research. Okay, so if, if I was a nonprofit and I wanted to do that, I would definitely be looking and listening and looking at the profiles of, of the, the foundations that are using social media and, and uh, learning and connecting with different staff members that are out there. And I would go to a place like the Glass Pockets blog, which is supposed to be about philanthropy and transparency. And there is a list there if you go into one of the sections, you'll find this list and you'll see all the foundations and you, you can actually sort them by. I want to see all their Facebook pages, all their blogs, all their uh, Twitter profiles. And then as you start to dig down into the Twitter profiles, you may start to find other staff members that you can actually start to be, build that relationship. Now in terms of a nonprofit using social media to generate funding, there is a story of, it was a organization in New Jersey that did um, uh, young people's uh, entrepreneur programs um, and it has a name it's going to come to me it's a national organization and they have affiliates and so the development director had started using Twitter and she was saying things like sign up for our golf charity event and she was getting crickets 
And then she said, okay, I'm going to start figuring out who's following me. I'm going to start figuring out like, who's interested in like, um, after school um, programs and who's talking about that on Twitter. And she found um, this person who is the founder of a local family foundation. And she found them on Twitter. It was one of her followers. And she started talking to her on Twitter. And then she got invited to lunch. And then the funder actually made a grant. Um, of $35,000 to uh, fund her program. I, I don't think that it right now is the norm. But it, is po it shows that it, there is a possibility of this. Just a follow up for that question. Because the, your last um, advice really struck me, you said go beyond the county. I really, if you don't have the um, um, speech schedule yet, I really want to suggest you to uh, give a talk, talk to those Garden makers, because <laughs> in the, the nonprofit sector, every, everything is so connected. If if the education can come from the the, the money giver side, it will make so much easier for nonprofits to budget our money yeah. to invest into the social media strategy. Then we'll get the return on that investment. Yeah. And I think you know funders are, are coming a long way. Um, I mean, five, a, year, a couple of years ago, I was sort of. <laughs> taking that mantle up. But um, if you take a look at, like, for example, the Case Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, if you want to see an example of a, uh, you know, sort of, of the future of, uh, of, of a philanthropy organization embracing social media and connecting, just take a look at what Robert Wood Johnson is, um, is doing. And also, they did a great convening in the field of uh, the state of social media measurement. They brought together and started raising the dialogue around that. All right, with that, we'll say thank you to Beth Cantor. Yeah, right. Really appreciate it. All right, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah.